Okay, number five. Um, okay, let's see. Under the A201 general conditions, uh, which one of the following is not one of the architect's duties during construction? So, okay, reviewing samples and other submittals from the contractor. Responding to contractor questions regarding the design. Adjudicating disputes between the owner and the contractor. Making site visits to ensure that the construction is proceeding in accordance with the contract documents. Well, so those are kind of interesting ones, right? Um, because they all seem plausible and they all seem like maybe dangerous or something. Um, but the question here is which one of these is not the architect's duty? Uh, reviewing samples and other submittals from the contractor? Absolutely, that's one of the main things. Like you say, we need, uh, you know, um, a, a, a plum-colored brick. Well, they're going to show you some samples of plum-colored bricks. Uh, and you've got to choose one and you have to go through it and do, you know, that's part of the process. So A is absolutely something you're going to do. B, responding to contractor questions regarding the design. Yeah, that's what uh, it's, uh, um, an RFI, a request for information. That's where, you know, the drawings may be very clear for most things, but there's bound to be something that they just don't understand, or they just want to make sure that they understand exactly what you mean. Uh, you know, is the uh, smoke detector supposed to align with uh, the signage, or is it supposed to be offset from the signage? Uh, you know, those kinds of things which may not have been detailed fully in a, a smaller uh, set of drawings. At some point, somebody's got to place that smoke detector and they may say, hey, I need some information regarding the design. So RFIs, requests for information, absolutely part of your process. Uh, C and, and then D are kind of the two remaining ones that might be at issue. So adjudicating disputes between the owner and the contractor. Um, this is a fascinating one because, in fact, yes, as the architect, you are there partly to adjudicate disputes between the owner and the contractor. Now, this has always been sort of the case. Uh, it's always been one of the roles of the architects uh, is to sort of be the, the middle person and be the reasonable person and try to make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, but in 2007, uh, the AIA contracts actually uh, built in the idea of the initial decision maker, the IDM, and that is you, the architect. And so if there's a dispute between the owner and the contractor, the first place they're supposed to go is to the architect. And the architect, in this kind of interesting way, right, I mean, you have a contract with the owner, so you have allegiances and agency with the owner, but you're also professional, which puts you in a different category, right? You are there to uh, uphold the laws of the land, to protect the public. You're there to do a whole bunch of other things that aren't about your contract. So in this case, uh, what, your, what your job is, is to sort of put the I'm a neutral person your hat on and then try to adjudicate the, the, uh, the dispute. Um, so that is absolutely something that would be uh, part of your duties uh, during the uh, construction administration of a project. Could you ask us to define IDM again? Uh, the initial decision maker, which is a very odd, uh, un, not very good handle term, um, and it's literally only in the most recent uh, contracts. The contracts are rewritten every 10 years, so 2007 was the last one, uh, 2017 will be the new ones, and the new ones are going to be really fascinating, this is another time for another, uh, off in the distance, we'll talk about this at some other point, but um, how they're going to deal with all the Revit models and all that stuff, which is kind of changing everything in terms of schematic designs. And, all that. Um, so the 2017s are going to be really fascinating. Right now we're working on 2007s. You'll see that a lot of people actually still use the 1997s because they just got used to them and they liked them, so they just kept them. Um, but the exam will be uh, focused on the 2007 ones. And they're pretty similar, 1997 and 2007 are pretty similar. But there's a few things like the IDM got added in. So regarding adjudicating disputes, because I know there was one question about this as well. Um, just because you say you make your final decision, it doesn't mean that everybody has to like bow down to the god of the architect, right? They still could be. They can still say, I don't, I don't agree with you. I want to take it to a higher, uh, higher authority. And then what that higher authority is depends on the contracts and where you are, what, what part of the country you are, and a series of other um, issues. A lot of that is sort of local. Uh, law and local code, but there are four basic stages to adjudicating uh, disputes. 
like I said, IDM is sort of the most sort of straightforward, simple, right there on the site. You kind of figure it out. Uh, maybe you do written proposals from each side, uh, and then the architect writes a formal memo that says, yes, I, I believe it is this, and here's why. Um, so that's IDM, fairly simple and straightforward, no, no other players involved. And then the next step up would be mediation. And mediation is where uh, the entities to decide to bring in somebody and it has to be a mutually agreed upon somebody who is a sort of outside third party person who kind of comes in, steps in, and makes suggestions, like reviews all the information, uh, is sort of the reasonable third party person who uh, can review all the information and have a sort of a, the authority um, of a kind of sage person in the process. So they have a fair amount of actual authority. Um, but it's not as much authority as, say, a lawsuit or something. Um, you can still challenge it, uh, usually, uh, to a higher uh, uh, situation. But um, it's still it's a it's a big deal. It's a lot. Of, it's a big process. It's you're bringing in outside people now, so it costs money. So you have to really want to uh, like it, it can cost people a lot of money to go through a mediation process. So IDM mediation, and then the next level would be arbitration. So arbitration is very similar to mediation, except you're essentially saying, all right, this isn't just some third party person who is like a particularly trusted person in the industry. What we're saying is this person is actually, or this panel of people is actually essentially like a court. They're acting as a judge and jury. Um, and they have a uh, specific legal weight in the process. And the reason they have legal weight is because when you signed your contract, you said, yes, we will you know, abide by the arbitration of this or that. Um, you also can have in your contract, we will abide by the mediation as well. So like that could be part of the contract. So IDM, mediation, arbitration, and then the final one is litigation. So litigation is, yeah, this isn't some third party thing. This is an actual court case. This is somebody actually going into the, the justice system, uh, uh, civil presumably, um, but going into the justice system uh, and you actually have judges and potentially juries, depending on what kind of uh, case it is uh, and what state you're in, um, is, uh, you know, backlog might take uh, months or years or even decades to kind of get through a process uh, and will cost everybody, especially the taxpayers, a whole lot of money uh, and time. So uh, if you can keep out of litigation, the whole point of arbitration and mediation and IDM is to try to keep it out of that sort of god-awful litigation situation. Um, so you're trying to, uh, if you can do it right on the site um, with the, the architects, great. If not, we go to mediation, um, and if not, we go to arbitration, and then eventually it goes to litigation. Uh, not all situations can do all of them, um, but, uh, but that's the sort of the order that you would, uh, you would sort of understand them in. So uh, A, B, and C are all sort of true. So that means D, which sort of sounded pretty reasonable, uh, must be the actual correct answer here, which is the one that the, is not an architect's duty. But let's read D again. Making site visits to ensure that the construction is proceeding in accordance with the contract documents. Man, that sounds so good because you're making site visits, right? You're going to visit the site to sort of check things out. But there's two problems with this. One is the word ensure. Uh, which is like the word always or must, um, you're saying, I am uh, making sure, I'm absolutely 100% positive that things are going according to the contract documents. Well, think about also what the word, is this phrase, according to the contract, like what does that even mean? Like if you think about it, uh, let's say you're 30% way through the, through the project. Well, does it say somewhere on the contract documents what it should look like at 30%? Well, no, it doesn't, right? So you can't say, yes, I am ensuring that it's uh, in a construction, you know, it's in, in accordance with the uh, contract documents because there's nothing to judge it against. So uh, ensure and the pr sort of problem of the wording of that is definitely a problem with D, and that's why it makes it the correct answer. Um, so one other thing to say about, uh, about that is um, that the way that you would say D to make it be correct is that you're making site visits in order to uh, um, inform the owner that the uh, that it seems like the project will meet the design intent when it is complete. There's nothing so far that I've seen that would lead me to think that when the project is complete, 
it won't meet the design design intent. So what you're saying is at the end, I think it's like we may only be at 30% right now, but nothing I've seen yet tells me that at the end it won't be correct. Right? Um, you're not responsible for deciding when the slab goes in or when the windows go in. That's the GC's responsibility. So you can't be sort of deciding what the order of these things are. So uh, you can, however, say, well, they've done a bunch of work and um, they didn't put a foundation in for a piece of the building that's going to happen uh, uh, later and there's no way for them to go in and put the foundation in without ripping out stuff they've just finished. So I can reasonably go ahead and say to the owner, something's not right here. This isn't going to meet the design intent at the when the project is at the end. Um, so that's an example of how you would word that. Now, that's way more wordy and ridiculous than you would probably actually do on a site in a real person with real contractors. But you should understand why that's the meaning, why that's the way it's worded, uh, because it is meaningful to kind of uh, to start speaking erroneously about these things. You can actually set up very, very big problems for uh, your firm and for yourself. So answer to that one, D. Five is D the, uh, because of the word insure and the way it's written. Dan asks, what about project timeline? Can we say that this doesn't look like it'll be completed on time? Can you comment on that? And then um, lastly, Tim Ray is asking one more time, difference between arbitration and litigation. Okay. Um, so what about the timeline? Like, uh, yes, because uh, the timeline is actually part of the GC's contract with the owner. When the, 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 there's like three or four things that are part of that contract, one of them is that they're saying, yes, they will actually build the thing that you drew, and so the, that set of drawings and, and documents will be dated and have a specific, and so that's in the contract. Um, and there's a few other things in the contract, but one of the, the price is obviously in the contract between the GC and the owner. Uh, but the other big thing is the timeline is in the, in the contract. Now, because con uh, um, projects, construction projects are so complicated, there's so many different factors involved, the timelines often are just sort of, well, they are what they are. Everybody wants to get it done as sort of reasonably fast as possible, but things happen. And so it's not always something that you spend a lot of time worrying about because, you know, what are you going to do about the weather or whatever. But there's a lot of projects where the timeline is actually really important. Like if you're doing school or something, like things got to be open by uh, the time the kids arrive, right? So uh, timelines, the schedules can be very much a, an important part of it. And yes, uh, it is reasonable um, since that is actually part of the end of the, the, the design intent at the end of, the, of their contract uh, is reasonable to comment on it uh, and to, to say something. However, um, it is also very important not to take control of the, con the um, timeline. You absolutely do not want to be telling anybody to stop work. You absolutely do not want to be telling anybody to um, uh, that this will not work or you must you know, start doing this now, you know, you should stop doing that and start doing this. Um, once you start saying it like that, you're now in control of that schedule. And when the school kids show up and the building isn't done, uh, they're all going to try to sue the contractor and the contractor is going to turn and look at you and say, hey, you took control of the schedule. It's on you, right? So you absolutely want to be very, very careful about talking about the uh, uh, schedule and timeline. Okay, back to the arbitration versus litigation issue. Um, the arbitration is you're not uh, involving the standard court system. Um, it's its own uh, setup, so it's a legal setup, but it's uh, it's more like you're doing it through uh, like a, a law office than you're doing it um, uh, through the court. Now, the courts may mandate arbitration, so you go into court and then they send you to arbitration and then you go to this third party thing and, and do it. So they can be related to, to the courts, um, but it's a third party, it's not a civil court. Uh, litigation refers to an actual uh, judge, potentially jury, uh, uh, lawyers litigated uh, process. D is the one that uh, is not, and it's because of the word insure, and because of the way it's sort of written out, like uh, how would you be able to compare the uh, proceeding in accordance with the contract documents if you were at, say, 45% done? Like, what does that even mean? There's, there's no part of the contract documents 
that says, okay, this is what it should look like at 45%. And the reason there isn't is because that's not your job. That's the job of the GC to figure that stuff out. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, and thanks to all of you who've tuned in. And if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. Uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the broadcast, just like today. Um, and to learn more about our AIA ARE prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com. Uh, we'll uh, include, a note, uh, include a link in the show notes. Uh, and for those of you who are ready and, and want to go ahead and get busy preparing for the ARE, uh, you can use a coupon, uh, a 15% coupon off the first charge on any AIA ARE prep membership with code 527-1515-WEBINAR. That's 527-15-WEBINAR. Uh, and that'll expire on June 15th. Um, and of course, if you're already an AIA member, you can visit AIA.org slash ARE prep to get a 30% discount for the entire duration of your AIA ARE prep membership, not just the first charge. Um, and that also uh, expires on June 15th. Um, and finally, uh, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think um, and share any suggestions um, that you may have. I promise uh, we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. Uh, so thanks for watching.